there, everyone! Welcome to episode number 643 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. This week's Fish Fry is all about AI inference, NPUs, and the Tensilica NeuroEdge 130 AI coprocessor. My guest is Amol Borkar from Cadence Design Systems. And in addition to all of the things I just mentioned, we will also be talking about the industry trends pushing the need for AI coprocessors and the multitude of benefits that AI coprocessors can bring to your next design. So without further ado, please welcome Amol to Fish Fry. Hi, Amal. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. Nice to see you. And thanks for the opportunity. Good to connect with you again after a while. Absolutely. Okay. So we're talking about AI inferencing and AI coprocessors today. So Amal, what are some of the latest trends in AI inferencing and how are they shaping the role of the NPU? Yeah, Amelia, that's a very good question. So I think the latest trends in the AI landscape, as you're quite familiar with, you know, the big uptick was with this whole generative AI trend with the, you know, networks able to create new content quite easily. And then that progressed into the more of the manifestation or utilization of those generative AI type of networks going down the path of agentic AI to have AI agents to sort of like help you with maybe like chatbot type of applications and self-help type of services. And then the other path, which is now end of 2024, early 2025, has been picking up a lot of activity is this physical AI, where now we're starting to see a big trend of and surge of, you know, robotics companies and robotics activities. And everybody's starting to go down the space of, you know, doing things that can have a variety of these different types of robots and helping them come to some level of realization. Behind all of this that you can probably imagine, everything is already AI-based. So it's just adding to how much more AI compute you need to run and execute on your hardware. So then definitely your NPUs are starting to get more and more you know, powerful, more number of tops. You know, if you had probably talked to somebody a couple of years ago, it was you know maybe double digits of tops, 50, 60 tops. Now we're talking to customers and industry, you know, trendsetters who are looking like in the thousands of tops and higher because they're doing a lot more scene understanding, scene interpretation, and then figuring out what's the next things to do, developing, you know, 3D models and perceptions of the environment and all of those things. So having all of that run on the NPU is starting to become more and more important. And then the overall architecture and structure of the NPU is also, you know, has been evolving. Traditionally, the NPU was primarily like a a large Mac array where you would just compute, here's the number of Macs that I can do. And everybody was, you know, having a competition or a contest and the more number of Macs that they have. But now as we're seeing that, you know, Macs are not everything that run on an NPU. The NPUs are starting to become a little bit more self-sufficient as well. So the NPU by itself is starting to become a little bit more of a subsystem, really, if you look into it. If you look into the architectural diagram, you'll still see a Mac array, but usually assisting that a lot of times becomes like some purpose-built or specific hardware blocks. Like in some cases, you're seeing blocks that are used in these latest transformer networks to handle the attention processing, or in some cases, maybe the instance norm, the ReLUs, the SoftMax, all those types of operations. And then many customers or vendors are starting to put a box around that and say, oh, here's my little bit more holistic NPU subsystem that can now do more than just CNNs and Mac type of operations, giving much more capability and flexibility to the NPU solution. So Amal, what percent of AI workload gets offloaded from the MPU? And what kind of typical functions or operators or layers is this AI coprocessor executing? So Amelia, to your question, actually, there's probably one question that comes before that is, Does everything actually run on an NPU? Because when we see a lot of these advertisements from many of the silicon vendors, laptop designers, they say, we've got new AI hardware in there. And the general spotlight goes into, hey, my NPU is fully capable. It can do everything in the world. But the truth is actually not all the layers of the network typically can end up running on the NPU. 
So there is a variety of reasons. One is because the AI landscape is constantly evolving. It's a moving target versus the NPU is usually a hardened piece of silicon. So if you design your NPU today, you need to be able to execute networks that are probably relevant 16 to 18 months down because that's the time you'll get your silicon back or your new NPU. If your NPU cannot run it, then you have a challenge that I've got this very expensive piece of silicon. I can't use it. I still want to get use of it. Otherwise, it's a very expensive dollar sink that has happened over here. So we're starting to see customers who, you know, depending on how broadly spec they design their NPU to try to capture as much of the future workloads can run on there. It could be maybe 5% of the offload comes from the NPU, could be 50%, just depending on how specific the customer has decided their architecture and the expectation of the workloads coming in the future. Now, typically the convolution type of operations would end up happening on the NPU. If they have some additional specific accelerators in their NPU solution, as I talked in the first question, that this NPU is starting to become more of a subsystem. We're starting to see customers add maybe blocks for attention. They are adding blocks to do some of the ReLU operations, softmax, batch norms, instance norms. Those are the type of operations we're typically expecting in a lot of the AI networks. Now, if the customer designing an NPU has all of these functions and a lot of their variants included in this NPU architecture, then they might have a very small portion that gets offloaded to an AI coprocessor. But typically, adding all these operations also means that it can add to a lot of PPA. And adding to PPA means area, power, and that may not make it as a very competitive design. So it's a trade-off over there. And so that's why there's no quantitative answer. I can say definitely 27.5% is what somebody offloads. So it's a spectrum and varies depending purely on how you could say over spec somebody might design their NPU. All right. So Amal, talk to me about the new Tensilica NeuroEdge 130 AI coprocessor announced at Cadence Live Silicon Valley. Yeah, Amelia, that's actually a great question. It's one of the newest products from Tensilica. So a couple of things actually over here. So one, it is a new class of processors. We're calling it an AI coprocessor because the idea is it's meant to complement an NPU inside a subsystem. And this NPU can be in a couple of flavors. We have our own in-house developed NPUs from a Neo family. We can partner it with that. It could also pair with a third-party NPU IP. Or in many cases, we have customers who are building their SOC and their own proprietary NPU. It could complement that particular solution. And the idea over here with the co-processor is folks that I've talked to have said different definitions for co- so I say CO stands for three things, complementary, control, and companion. It's a companion because no AI subsystem is complete without a coprocessor. You always need to offload something from the NPU to have end-to-end -end execution of an AI network. The complementary part is because your NPU, as we discussed, may not be able to run all the layers or all the portions of the AI network. Sometimes you've got pre-processing, you've got post-processing, you've got these instance norms, batch norms, softmax, all of this. If they don't run on your NPU subsystem, they'll get offloaded to your coprocessor. And then the control part is usually the NPU needs some type of an external command signaling to say, hey, execute this workload or you know, give me an interrupt back once this is processed. You could say it's a more streamlined version of a CPU that is targeted to be part of an AI subsystem. So these are you know, the benefits of why you would have this AI coprocessor that we announced, new offering from Cadence Tensilica. And also it's something unique because this is the first time we've seen a Tensilica product also announced at Cadence Live during a keynote presentation from our CEO. So a lot of good things. We feel like we've positioned this product for the market and there's a lot of demand for this product in the market as well. Fantastic. All right. So, Amal, let's back it up a little bit. Why does the industry overall need an AI coprocessor? Yeah. So, the industry needs an AI coprocessor because, you know, as we've discussed in a bunch of these questions, is that we assume that the NPU is the holy grail. It's going to do everything. You throw an AI network at it, it's going to run. We're seeing this, you know, evolution of the NPU starting to become a subsystem. But even though this is a subsystem, the blocks inside that are still usually hardened, which means that they are fixed function blocks. If some new type of operator comes in, can my compiler map to this hardware? And if it can't map to the hardware, it would usually fall back to the apps processor or the CPU. General problem with that is the CPU is not 
sitting around free idling. It's usually doing housekeeping tasks or running the operating system or whatever. So anytime you need to go and bug the CPU to help it to run an AI workload, not only it's a performance impact, but it probably impacts the other workload that it was itself dedicated to do. So we know that the NPUs are going to offload some things that it cannot run as part of this AI network. So why not offload it to a processor that is designed to handle the offloads, which is why the AI coprocessor is there. And we've established that this is the use of the AI coprocessor. And as we mentioned, you know, how much gets offloaded, that percentage really varies depending on how flexible or future-proof that NPU solution that you have. So it could be, you know, 5% of your network gets offloaded, maybe 20%, maybe 50%, who knows? But we we provide the comfort and the future proofing and the scaling and the flexibility to the NPU provider that whatever percentage needs to offload will help you with that. So Amal, give me some examples of AI coprocessors in the industry today. Sure. You know, in one way, we are establishing that like it's a new class of processors, the AI coprocessor. But Interestingly enough, the actual use case of an AI coprocessor has been around for quite some time. So even in many of our Tensilica designs, we see our Vision DSPs or our Hi-Fi DSPs actually sitting right next to an NPU doing an AI coprocessor function. Maybe it's the layers that do not run on the network. Maybe it's the pre-processing or the post-processing all of these functions we end up doing. So this coprocessor usage has been there, but it does end up causing sometimes a little bit of confusion because customers sometimes say that, hey, I'm running an AI workload. Why am I putting a vision DSP next to my NPU when I'm not doing any vision type of processing? So this helps a little bit with also the product positioning that we've got a complementary processor for your NPU sitting right next to it and does the coprocessing function. Not only is this our view, If we actually look in the industry outside in the public domain, there are many examples of where the AI coprocessor is used. And I've shown this in my public presentation also. NVIDIA, for example, in their Jetson Orin or their Xavier SOC, they actually have a PVA, which is called a Programmable Vision Accelerator. So this sits next to their NPU, which is their DLA, Deep Learning Accelerator. And they have actually used this to help their NPU process functions that the NPU does not run. So here in this case, it's a pre-processing, it's the post-processing, sometimes non-maximal suppression, softmax, those type of operations, which their NPU can't run, get offloaded to their PVA. So the PVA actually does help and act as a coprocessor. You can also search for Intel Gaudi 3, which is their NPU subsystem. So inside their NPU subsystem, inside the Gaudi 3, They've got, I think they call the MME, which is the multiply matrix engines. But sitting right next to that is what they call a TPC, a tensor processing core, in a different name, but it is performing the functions of an AI coprocessor. It acts like a DSP, helps with operations that don't run on their MME. Similar example, if you look at Qualcomm Hexagon, in most of their designs, they have their Hexagon tensor processor, HTP, but next to their Hexagon tensor processor, they've got a vector unit which basically acts as an AI coprocessor. And also in the Google TPU, they've got the big tensor engine, but next to the tensor engine, they've got a vector unit and a scalar unit. So these act as AI coprocessors in some sense. Again, the percentage depends on the generation of the architecture and how much their NPU solution is capable of. But what we're trying to point out over here is you may have not seen the AI coprocessor specifically called out, but many of these vendors outside are actually using this AI coprocessor function without giving the actual name for it. But it does operate in this function of helping their main NPU offload things that it can't run for a variety of reasons. All right, Amal, that was super cool. But before I let you go, you get your new off the cuff. So Amal, if you could have a meal with one person right now, living or dead, pick any person throughout time, who would it be? Well, since this is a publicly recorded podcast, and, you know, I have to say it has to be with my wife. (laughs) At some point, she might check this podcast. So she is obviously number one in my life. So I have to make sure that I go for a, a dinner date with her. And as I said last time, and I'll say this time too, I still love steaks. I'll probably go for a double date steak dinner. Maybe in this case, we might get a tomahawk and slice that between the two of us. But yes, absolutely. 
So first part of that is it'll be the missus <laughs> that will come for dinner with me. And second is probably going to be a steak. <laughs> I love it. Very political answer. Very well done, Amal. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amelia. Always a pleasure talking to you. Look forward to talking to you again. Well, folks, that's all I've got for this week's Fish Fry. But I've got some super cool interviews lined up for the rest of the summer, including my chat with Toronto Talks podcast host Ash Amin about his neat AI co-host, my discussion about the challenges of connectivity integration with Tau Glass CEO Dermot O'Shea and more. So make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to these and other exciting upcoming episodes. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, you can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is jock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of August 1st, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.